All right, evening, everyone. You can be seated. Welcome to another Peaceful Solution uh, Character Education Teacher Certification Training Course. Um, we are continuing in the self control unit this evening as we move forward, and we are getting closer. Getting closer to the end of this book here, we are in Lesson 6, <coughs> or Chapter 6, that is. So we have one more chapter to go um, after this. But um, as I've always been, uh, brought out before, everything is building one block, one stone, uh, you know, one building block from one to another in the building of a positive character. Now this unit that we're in right now and dealing with self-control like it's been mentioned by if I'm not mistaken it's been mentioned by pretty much every teacher how important this unit is in being a foundation to to tie together all the other uh, character traits all the other units that we have covered and are going to cover because without it right without self-control you're you know you're pretty much kinda useless you know it's kinda like um Kind of like having a, a, a powerful vehicle or a powerful car and, and no way to, to steer it. You know, no way to apply the brakes, no way to um, give it gas, to, to make it go faster, right? You know, that's, that's kind of what self-control is to us. It gives us the ability to uh, turn it on, turn, turn things off, uh, to turn them in a certain direction, right or left, forward or reverse. Uh, to make them go and to make them stop. That is our thoughts and our actions we're referring to. And so when we think about this, you know, think about the importance of us as, as teachers and as we train our students, um, getting our students to understand that it's very, very important for each person to continuously look at themselves, right? Continuously examine themselves, continuously um, kind of compare themselves to the standard that they're learning in the peaceful solution to find out if if they're living up to that standard or if they're if they're falling short a little bit and if they need to make some adjustments in their life okay and it's very important that we you know in the peaceful solution the one you'll notice this throughout all the lessons the very first lesson usually and the second lesson kind of gets into the individual Right? What does it mean for you to have a positive character? What does it mean for acceptance and you to have understand what acceptance is in your life? And self-control is one of those things as well. Well, I'm going to look back here to page uh, lesson plan six, page A, and we're going to look back here. And I just want to read this again for myself. This is something that I recommend that as teachers you do for every lesson. Right? Not that you necessarily have to go back and and reread the uh, purpose and objective before every class, but it's it's handy to keep this information fresh in your mind, to keep it kind of setting up uh, in the forefront of your mind because it tells you what you're wanting to accomplish with the lesson. By the time you get to the end of this lesson, this is what you're wanting to accomplish. So, you know, even as a teacher, we might have to kind of go back if we question our students and the responses we get. We might have to go back and see to it that we need to um, re rehash certain things. So on Lesson Plan 6, page A, it says students will learn how an individual's choice in practicing self-control affects society. All right, so how an individual's choice in practicing self-control affects society. Also, students will learn that an individual's lack of self-control has consequences for a society. So now we're giving them both sides of the coin, so to speak. Right, we're giving them the positive and the negative effects that can come from either practicing or not practicing self-control. All right, and so Chris and William kind of went back through some of these um, earlier chapters here or earlier pages. We're not going to be covering that. We're going to be moving forward here. To uh, William left off on page 157, and he was talking about the effects of stealing. That's kind of where he left off, and that's where we're going to be picking up um, on page 158 when we calculate the cost. The effects of stealing. <clears throat> I mentioned it before in, in, my, in my past that I've had an incident of stealing. How many of you have ever experienced or suffered or been the victim of theft? All right. So most of you have. Excuse me there. Been the victim of theft. Um, like I mentioned before, 
I remember, um, I don't know, I had to be a preteen, maybe my early teens. I remember uh, I rode my bike to the store, <clears throat> and, um, and I came back out, and my bike was gone. <laughs> you know, my bike was gone, and I remember thinking, you know, the feeling that I had, it was pretty overwhelming at the time. Just give me a second here. I'm not getting emotional over the bike. But, um, but I remember feeling pretty, pretty overwhelmed. Um, feelings of violation, um, distrust, sadness, you know, anger, a little anger. All these things were going through my mind uh, at the time. And it stuck with me for a pretty long time there. Just give me a second. It stuck with me for a pretty long time there. Um, and that was just one occurrence. Uh, I know people who live in neighborhoods that these things occur on a regular basis. If you can just give me one second, I'll be right back. that I went through in experiencing those things, experiencing the theft, uh, not having my bike to ride back home. And, uh, you know, that was not something I worked for, but it was something that I received as a gift. So it was very, it's very important to me. And so on page 157 here, uh, the last part here, the effects of stealing, I just want to rehash what William covered in the previous class. He says, um, or it reads here, the crime of theft takes many different forms. Robbery, burglary, shoplifting, pickpocketing, and grand larceny are only some of the ways people illegally take what someone else rightfully owns. And, you know, ownership, we covered that. We talked a lot about ownership and the importance of ownership and the fact that everybody has rights regarding their belongings. You know, to own something means simply that something belongs to you. And everybody has rights regarding their possessions. They can set rules over them. Uh, if you borrow their belongings, they have right to set how things are used, for how long a period those things can be used uh, for, and how they need to be treated, okay? Um, but when people don't understand these things, when people don't value ownership, now they typically do when it comes to their belongings, right? Even, even thieves don't like to be stolen from, but it's not as big a deal if they take from somebody else. And then you get these people who have the, um, the Robin Hood mentality, the Robin Hood mentality to think that, ah, uh, you know, they're rich, they can afford to lose a little bit of this or a little bit of that. And, you know, besides, we're poor in society. What, what is a company like? You've got the big box stores like Walmart and, well, you used to have Kmart. You don't have Kmart anymore. Um, you know, Target and you know, places online, you know, the, the stores that you can go into, grocery stores, 
and you know people's mindset is all oh, these stores make hundreds of millions of dollars a year or billions of dollars a year what does it matter if I take something that's you know fifty dollars or a hundred dollars right well it matters because that store owns that right that store has the rights of ownership this is why when you walk out of the store without paying for something it's called stealing right if it was the people's the people's belongings then uh, you can just go in and there take something off the shelf and walk out of the store but it belongs to the store that right of ownership is transferred to the customer or the consumer when they pay for it okay and everybody's kind of under that general uh, agreement uh, when you come on to a particular store or premises <coughs> to do business with them. So this is what takes place. These are some of the ways that um, people illegally take what someone else rightfully owns. Now, stealing deprives the owner of the use of their belongings and creates an environment of fear and mistrust. And that environment, as you know, William talked about in the last class, you know, it can it can ripple out from you know a group of people a family a house a neighborhood uh you know to an entire community uh an entire city an entire state even an entire nation okay and there could be a reputation that's associated with going different places or certain places i knew when i grew up uh you know coming up in cleveland and even here in abilene you know there are neighborhoods that have a a negative association to them, a negative reputation uh, because a lot of crime takes place in that neighborhood. You know, there might be a lot of carjackings, <clears throat> there might be a lot of uh, burglaries, there might be a lot of, um, uh, you know, people just coming up to you on the street and robbing you, right? Uh, you know, there's a lot of things associated with this, so it, it affects and, and creates an environment. Remember, everything that's kind of around you uh, including the people, they help to make that environment up of fear and mistrust. <clears throat> so you see people who will, you know, uh, you know, the, <laughs> they'll walk and the, the ladies will, will clutch their purse. I remember being down in, um, uh, when we went down to Argentina, I think I mentioned this before, and we were, you know, we were going to different places and having different uh, meetings and, and presentations and so forth. And, and, you know, it was a place that we had never been before. So, you know, we were kind of, taking pictures of things because we we would use those things in uh, in videos and presentations and so forth and uh, and I remember I don't think I had my arm out all the way but I had my arm kind of a little bit out of the window and the uh, the taxi driver kind of cautioned me not to do that because people like to come by because you know it's a lot of tourists that take taxis and so forth people like to come by and snatch your phone out of your hand <clears throat> while people are taking pictures and, and it was interesting because while we were there, I noticed a lot of, I, I would say the locals, because it looked like they were people that were going to work or to school or kind of carrying on about their daily life. They didn't look like uh, tourists. They didn't have their Hawaiian shirts and, you know, pastel pants on and things like that. Um, flippy flops <laughs> walking around down there. But, um, but they just look like everyday people going about their lives. And I noticed that a great majority of people that were there carried their backpacks on their front, right? The straps were in the back and the backpack was in the front. And I asked about that and he says, because people like to come by on bikes and, or mopeds, because there were a lot of like mopeds out there, that mopeds that people were riding around on, and snatch the, bi snatch the bag off the person's back, you know, when, they, when they're not aware of it. It was a little bit harder to do that from the front than from the back. I'm sure if somebody's really determined they could accomplish that goal, but this is one of the reasons why people did that. So that it created a little bit of, um, like we see here, mistrust, right, in their environment because you know, people work hard for their belongings. You know, they should be able to enjoy them for however long that they want to without having to worry about somebody else coming and stealing them, taking away their ability to, to use their belongings. Like it says here, um, let's see here. Stealing, no, no, depriving, uh, take, depriving the owner of the use of their belongings, right? And so these are just some of the things that I saw, uh, and I'm sure that you've seen many other things that have taken place growing up. I mean, when I grew up uh, also um, kind of in the, in the inner city, a lot of houses had, uh, you know, the cast iron bars on their windows and doors. 
Um, and they made them ornate and decorative and so forth, and they would be painted white and black. And so, you know, I mean, it was, you know, kind of nice to see. But, but a lot of places had those, and it was always on the first floor because people would break into the house. Well, you know, it was less likely that people were going to spend the time cutting through a cast iron bar, you know, because you make a lot of noise doing that and you wake up the homeowner um, and, and to try to break into a house. You know, so these are some of the things, you know, I remember the alarms, the alarms that people put on cars. Now, you know, people used to steal horses back in the day. I don't think they had horse alarms, but, um, you know, I, I, I know a horse thief was somebody that was considered like the worst of the worst. Because, you know, that horse was not just something that got a person from point A to point B. A lot of times horses were used to uh, plow land and to, you know, dig ditches and to make roads and things like that. I mean, that was like the main source of work. That was a person's livelihood. So when you stole their horse, you know, you weren't just stealing a source of transportation. You were stealing a person's means to take care of their family. Well, you know, cars kind of tuck the places to some extent of a horse, um, at least for transportation. And, and I remember in, my, in the neighborhood that I grew up in many areas, uh, that was something you'd hear all hours of the night, you know, the alarms going off. And uh, the people had the alarms that made like five different tones and sirens and, uh, 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 and sounded like an ambulance and things like that. And it just got irritating at 2 o'clock in the morning hearing that because they had the sensitivity set so high that if somebody, you know, his car backfired, you know, five car alarms were going off throughout the neighborhood. But people did this because they were, you know, their vehicles were an investment to them. They needed them to go to work. Some people didn't need them to go to work. They just needed them to kind of flop, no, they, to, to look great, right? You know, they needed them to kind of make an impression. Um, and, uh, but there's always, I noticed there was always someone else who would find a way around that system of protection, that system of security. Um, I mentioned before about the, uh, the guy that, that lived at the place that I worked at. He had, this, he had this big fancy Cadillac and he had these, you know, big fancy chrome and I think they were like a chrome and gold wheels on there and, uh, you know, the, 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 the low profile tires with the, with the, with the gold ring, you know, um, gold wall I don't know what they call it white wall but a little gold on there too you know he was he was pretty pleased with his vehicle right you know he kept it washed every day and uh, he didn't want anybody to buy it he didn't want nobody touching it or anything like that well I remember coming outside one morning about five o'clock in the morning and I saw his vehicle setting on cinder blocks now he had all the fancy alarms and you know sensitivity things and wheel locks he had a uh, uh, lug nut locks on his lugs and everything and they had that vehicle perfectly balanced in the center of the vehicle where it would not tilt forward or backwards and set off the alarm you know so it's like a lot of these things are done so that you can have your protections or somewhat somewhat preserve your possessions but that doesn't make the thief follow the rules right the only way you can get the thief to follow the rules is to educate them and of course they to some degree have to want to be educated but but to educate them so they can see how their activities bring harm not only to the person they're stealing from but also to themselves and so but like we say you know this creates an environment of fear and mistrust um, in addition to this notice here force and violence are often used against the victims leaving them physically hurt mentally scarred and fearful for life. Victims also have been killed during the act of stealing because they attempted to protect themselves uh, or their belongings. And that, you know, that's a sad uh, fact in life because many people have lost their lives in the, as a result of trying to protect themselves or their belongings or, or even, uh, you know, a loved one um, who someone's trying to kidnap or take uh, from them and they end up, you know, dragging them down the road or something like that. Uh, because people don't respect these rights of ownerships. ownership. It appears that people will steal anything, pets, bicycles, clothes, cars, lawn ornaments, money, and yes, even other people, as in the case of kidnapping. Uh, any item you, you can think of is probably being taken every few minutes or less. And just lastly here, just uh, uh, as we get ready to transition on page 158, it says, in an area 
where there is a high rate of theft, nothing is safe. In order to keep themselves and their possessions safe, people spend a great deal of money to buy additional locks for their doors and windows, as well as security systems for their cars and homes. And of course, this is something that we've seen uh, increase, rapidly increase in this time period. Um, you know, in the digital age, so to speak, we're seeing an increase in uh, things like uh, doorbell cameras and, and so forth. Uh, people also have like um, uh, light cameras where they have uh, like the security, the LED security lights that are motion activated. Well, there's also a little camera in there too. And uh, you don't even have to be home anymore. And the doorbell camera will automatically detect motion and send a little uh, alert to your phone through the app and let you know that someone's approached the door. And you can talk to them through the app, and you could be halfway across the world in another state or at work, right? Um, and it was interesting because through this, they've, they've caught a lot of people. They've caught a lot of people stealing packages. You know, this is a real big problem in, in, the, in society, especially in the United States, in dealing with, like, Amazon that, that delivers packages all over the place, um, all times of day, uh, even throughout the week. You know, even Saturdays and Sundays, they deliver packages, and... And people expect their packages to be, you know, left home and uh, come back home and, oh, there's their package. They can get the thing that they spent their money for. Well, people like to what they call them um, porch pirates, right? Porch pirates, they'll follow kind of these Amazon trucks or drive around in the neighborhood and they'll look for those brown packages sitting on the doorstep and they'll run and go and take it, right? And there's been several videos where people have been caught doing that or people have set up, you know, like booby traps and things like that. Um, to, to catch people who've actually done that. Uh, one lady was trying to run away after doing so, after the person came out of their house and caught him, and she actually snapped her ankle, you know, fell right on the ground and snapped her ankle, and their supposedly buddy old pal that was the getaway driver almost left her, <laughs> sitting there in the front lawn, had to turn around and come back and pick her up. You know, what, what, what benefit does that bring to a person in society? A person who has to live their life stealing from other people, right? You can never truly enjoy the things that you steal because you always live in fear. The thief does, uh, lives in fear that someone's going to recognize that possession, right? So in order to keep themselves safe and their possessions safe, people spend a great deal of money to buy additional locks for their doors and windows, as well as security systems for their homes. Buy trained dogs to frighten would-be thieves, um, and they purchase burglar alarms, high-tech security systems, and even guns all in an attempt to keep themselves and their possessions safe. Wouldn't it, man? I remember the old Doberman Pinscher. The Doberman Pinscher. That was the one. That was the go-to guard dog that always, <laughs> on the movies, always chased the guy to the fence. And just as he's getting over the fence, the Doberman Pinscher bites him in the trousers. Right? You know, and he's just hanging on him, hanging on him, keeping him from climb over the climbing over the fence. You know. Um, and people, you know, they, that was their go-to, you know, get security dogs, uh, get um, people sometimes had like, uh, I guess more wealthy people had like barbed wire or, or razor wire in some, some cases. I know they use that in the, the prison systems. They'll use razor wires at the top of sometimes electrical fences. Like if you make it up the electrical fence, you're going to risk cutting yourself and bleeding to death. Um, uh, to keep people, in that case, from getting out, but others, in other instances, keep people from getting in. And so there's a lot of money spent yearly on these types of things. I don't think so much on Doberman pictures anymore. Um, but all in an attempt, all in an attempt to protect your belongings and to kind of provide a little sense in the person's mind of security, right? When they go to bed at night, they let the dogs out. At the very least, if the dog doesn't catch the person, at least they can alert the homeowner by barking and so forth, all right? So we're going to go to page 158 here, and um, just to kind of keep us all in the same scheme of things here, uh, procedure number three, which is where uh, this page would fall into, we'll reread that. It says, explain to students that a lack of self-control and stealing has far-reaching negative consequences on the individual and society. <clears throat> Have students turn to page 156 and read the section entitled, The Lack of Self-Control Affects Our Society. 
and have students turn to page 159, which is going to be coming up here soon, and read the personal account of one woman's experience with the crime of theft and then discuss the questions. Allow students to complete the exercise on the bottom of page 160 and ask volunteers to share what they wrote with the class. So we're going to go over to page 158 here. 158. And we're going to look at um, calculate the cost of theft. All right, calculate the cost of theft. Uh, now remember when this was written, this was in the year, the year 2000, when uh, these articles were coming, uh, were being put in these books in this uh, in the uh, peaceful solution here. So this was data that was gathered from uh, previous previous months and years. Well, here we are, 22 years later, right? Uh, technology has increased. The amount of security systems and anti-theft systems on vehicles have increased. But you know what? It was funny because I was just reading uh, the latest statistic from 2020, which actually showed that certain crimes of theft increased during the year of 2020. Not decreased, but increased. And this is despite the ongoing spending of security systems that people are just dumping billions and billions of dollars into uh, manufacturers' hands uh, to buy protection, so to speak. It says here, during the year 2000, in the United States alone, the following number of arrests were made for the crime of theft. And note the numbers are an approximate. The numbers are approximate. These numbers of theft are just approximate numbers. Larceny, which uh, here is theft. And we'll go into some of the definitions on these here. Uh, seven million. Now these are these are arrests. Seven million arrests. Uh, burglary, two point one million. Cars stolen, one point two million. Robbery, five hundred thousand. And um, it says an intruder enters a home every fifteen seconds. So, in one minute, you're going to have four homes entered into. Just one minute, four homes. Now you've got every 15 seconds, right? 24 hours in the day. Do the math. I didn't. <laughs> but it's a lot of people. It's a lot of pe people's houses that are being broken into. 60% of residential burglaries occur during daylight hours. Why is that? Most of the time people aren't home. You know, you know that you, th you think the thief will come out at night, you know, to be a uh, less detectable, but really, people aren't home. You know, mother and dad, they work their jobs. The children are out at school. You know, the uh, duh, uh, puffies at uh, boarding camp, you know, because <laughs> you know, they don't want to leave them at home by himself. And, you know, people are very creative. They'll, they'll put on uh, cable installer uniforms or plumber uniforms, or uh, I've even seen them uh, pull up in, not personally, but accounts of it, people pull up in locksmith trucks, right? With the big locksmith sign on the side of their truck and break in the house and then go and do what they need to do and then leave the house, lock the door, and head on out to the next job, right? There's nobody home. So, but 60% of these burglaries occur during daylight hours. <clears throat> I know they always said, you know, the best place to hide something is in plain sight. People are expecting those things to occur at night, but kind of neglect the fact that they'll occur during the daytime as well. 63% of all burglaries involve forcible entry, right? They, they don't have a key. Uh, the door wasn't left open. You know, if someone accidentally leaves the door open, no, it's forcible entry. Bypassing the lock or security system, whatever the case might be. Breaking a window. And it says from 1990 to 2000, consumers spent more than... $42.8 billion on home security. That was from 1990 to 2000. So just a, a, a time span of 10 years. And we're going to see here a little bit uh, what people are spending nowadays on, on home security. Uh, obviously, it's, it's a lot more. But I just wanted to read a couple, of, uh, a couple of definitions here because I personally had to kind of get a clear understanding on, you know, some of these things like larceny, we've heard of the statement grand larceny, grand larceny, 
uh, burglary and so forth. Um, and I just wanted an understanding for myself. And this is something that as a teacher, you want to you make sure that your students understand these things as well um, so that they can you know, recognize the different types of crimes, not so that they can try to do one over the other so they'll get a lighter sentence, but so that they can just be informed. They could be educated about it. Uh, larceny, it says in, the, in Texas, um, under Texas Penal Code, code, a person commits larceny when they take property from another, both tangible, now tangible is a thing that is perceptible by touch, right? Uh, you know, this, 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 this desk is tangible, your books that you have in your hand, they're tangible, your car outside or whatever, your bike, you know, those are tangible items, okay? Um, and intangible, so we're talking about larceny here, when a person takes property from another that is both tangible and intangible, intangible is just opposite there, unable to be touched or grasped, uh, not having a physical presence, right? So some, you know, people can take, I don't know if you've heard of uh, intellectual property, right? They can uh, actually steal a person's idea. Uh, you know, they can steal certain uh, information uh, even on a computer. You can't really hold computer information in your hand. It's just a series of ones and zeros. But people can actually go and, and uh, physically download information off the computer or even, you know, remotely do it through the Internet or the um, intranet, you know, in an office and take things uh, off of a person's computer or phone or, or whatever the case might be. So intangible, which is something that is uh, not having a physical presence. <clears throat> and it also is with the intent to deprive the owner of the property. Um, the, with the intent of the, depriving the owner from the pro, of the property. So again, this goes right back to what we said there, um, depriving the person of the use of their belongings. And this is something like William covered last time. It does not necessarily just have to be a physical thing. You know, it could be something that's not physical as well. Well, even under the Texas Penal Code, you know, that is classified as larceny, right? That's classified as a form of theft, and there is a judgment associated with it. It says theft or larceny involves taking property without the use of force and without breaking into a structure to do so. So the use of force or breaking into a structure those fall into other categories. Robbery involves taking property from a person through force or the threat of force. Okay, and that's what we read here. 500,000 arrests between um, or in the year 2000 were made for robbery. Okay, somebody forced a person or threatened force in order to get somebody to give them what they had or to take something that somebody um, had. Uh, this can be not always striking a person. It could be, like we say here, the threat of force. You know, telling a person what they're going to do. You know, if you don't give me this, I'm going to do this to you. Or I'm going to do this to your family. I know where you live, and so forth. Those are, those are uh, robbing, robbing by violence, aggravated robbery, and so, and so forth. It says, while burglary involves breaking into a structure to commit a crime. So when... When someone commits that act, they're actually breaking into a house, right? Um, uh, somebody is uh, using a weapon when they're taking something by force, that's armed robbery, okay? Uh, and so, so these are some of the definitions that's, that's uh, it's great to have a, a general idea of them, right? Uh, as we go through these lessons and to kind of place this into your students' minds so they can know the difference between the two. Uh, but something else to keep in mind, and I think William mentioned this at the previous class, you know, identity theft, right? That's something that has been, it's not new, but it's something that has been picking up steam over the years with uh, the Internet because so many things are available on the Internet, on the web, uh, and as was mentioned, the dark web even, right? People actually work in, in these dark or on the dark web, uh, the hidden web, uh, the, the, they say the dark web is like compared to the, um, the uh, regular web, what a tip of an iceberg is to an entire iceberg. Like the dark web is that much bigger than the regular web that everybody else uses, right? And there's a lot of dark and 
and uh, deceptive things and, you know, people's identities are stolen and uh, you can buy all types of illegal substances, uh, including organs <laughs> off the dark web. Um, you know, on uh, several of my credit cards, um, and I think one of, my, one of my banks monitor activity from the dark web, for the dark web. Uh, and they are able to detect if something was uh, tried or attempted to be accessed through that, that, that web uh, to take my identity, you know. And, and so these things are really kind of, you know, if, if you think about it, they're, they're kind of unsettling because you don't know when someone's going through your information. <laughs> you know, you just don't know. You can't hear them creeping into your house. You know, you can't hear a dog barking to alert you to somebody sneaking around in your computer or at, in, in a database. You know, we've heard so many instances where there's been breaches for major stores, major manufacturers, um, not manufacturers, major um, uh, marketplaces, and it's been data breaches, you know, security breaches, and thousands, possibly even hundreds of thousands or millions of consumers data has been breached, compromised. So right away there, that's, you know, 200, 300, 400, maybe possibly a million or two million people who all their information is exposed, you know, just because of one little breach that occurred that somebody had access to. And so identity theft is something that's picked up in, um, in, in the last, well, at least it's been made more public in the news, you know, in the last 10 years or so. Identity theft affects about 1 in 20 Americans each year. Uh, according to Javelin's 2020 Identity Fraud Survey, 13 million consumers in the U.S. were affected by identity fraud in 2019, with the total fraud losses of nearly $17 billion. Just in one year, $17 billion in fraud losses because once this person steals your identity, whether it's a social security number, whether it's a credit card number, a bank account number, whatever the case is, then they'll start right away using that information to open up other accounts, uh, other accounts. They'll take out uh, loans, they'll take out mortgages, they'll buy cars, they'll, do, they'll make all these huge purchases and when the, the, the financial institution traces it back, it's not going to come back to the thief. It's going to come back to you. <coughs> and most, <coughs> most of the time, people find these things out when they go to do something like make a pretty big purchase. They go to purchase a house and to get a mortgage, and then it's, hey, you've got these marks on your, on your credit report. What are you talking about? Well, I see a Ferrari here. I see, a, you know, four van you know, vacations to uh, Cancun or, you know, um, wherever these places might be. There's loans that are open in your account that are in default. I've never done any of those things. Well, it's, it's on your credit. We're not going to be able to get you, uh, get you into this house here, you know. And that's when people find out those things. And so now they've got to work. They've got to go back. Sometimes they have to hire um, companies or firms that deal with this. Uh, they might have to uh, get legal help uh, to go and try to reestablish their identity, right? Like your credit is your reputation in the financial world. And if you've got bad reputation in the financial world, uh, in today's society, you'll still be able to get things, but it's going to cost you a lot more to get those things, okay? Uh, and in some cases, you might not be able to. But just in 2019, it, it was um, totaled fraud losses of nearly $17 billion. But preliminary do data shows 2020 may have seen an alarming rise in identity theft. Now this, this even despite the fact that um, there's been even more advertisements, more consumers are getting identity theft protection, a lot of uh, credit card companies are offering identity theft protection, banks are offering identity theft protection and so forth. And a lot of people are kind of jumping on this because they see how real it is, they've personally been affected by it, or they know people who have been affected by identity theft. So they're trying to trying to mitigate that as much as possible, but we're seeing things on the rise, right? These protections like the Doberman Pinscher, the alarm system, uh, the car alarm, the, uh, 
you know, wires on your fencing and so forth. It's not stopping dishonest people from being dishonest. And this is why education is so important because those thieves, right, they were once children at one point too. And whatever influence came into their mind, whether it was something that they experienced, uh, whether it's something that they, um, they saw somebody else doing, right, or it was taught to them, even sometimes by parents, you know, hey, you just got to take what you need. You know, you got to take what you want. If you want it, go get it, right? If they didn't, if they wanted it so bad, they wouldn't have just left it out there. You know, who leaves, who leaves their car unlocked in their own personal driveway or in their own garage, <laughs> you know? If they wanted it that bad, they should have locked it up. Now, that's the, that's the mentality of some people, okay? Uh, everything in life is a free-for-all, and the only time is wrong is when you get caught. And that's, that's, that brings a lot of heartache to society. It brings a lot of financial heartache to society as well. Someone becomes the victim, there's another statistic here, of identity fraud every 14 seconds. Uh, studies have shown that every 14 seconds, someone becomes a victim of identity theft in the US. Now think about that because that's that's someone sneaking in to your cyber house, so to, so to speak, and stealing your identity or starting the process of stealing our, your identity. Now if you're having a really bad day, in one of those 15 seconds, somebody will be breaking into your personal house, your physical house, your tangible house to steal something out of there. You know, and you get hit with a double whammy. So we're seeing things on both, on both sides, you know, uh, the physical and the not physical, the tangible, the intangible. You know, these are forms of larceny. Right? These are forms of theft. And these things have negative consequences to society, <coughs> you know, to where even some companies are, are putting these extra charges on, um, on, uh, um, on statements and so forth to cover you know, the potential for identity theft. Um, I don't remember how long it's been, but it's been about, um, oh, I'd probably say uh, at least 20 years, 20 years that insurance companies had to start putting uninsured motorists on insurance, you know, on your insurance. You had to pay for uninsured motorists because people would drive without insurance they crash into your car, and who was left holding the bill? Well, your insurance was left holding the bill because you're paying for insurance to protect your car in case of, you know, damage or loss or theft and so forth, right? Well, in the case of an accident where it's the other person's fault, well, the insurance company goes after that other person. But what occurs when that person doesn't have insurance, right? The insurance company kind of has to eat the bill on that, right? So they started requiring uninsured motorist um, insurance on plans. And so even as consumers, we're doing our part to make sure that we're all insured up, make sure that we have all the necessary coverage to protect ourselves. And heaven forbid, you know, we, we hit somebody else and damage their property. We recover to, you know, get our vehicle fixed and to see to it that they're taken care of as well. But now we have to pay for the person who's irresponsible. Right? We have to pay for the person who does not follow the rules. Okay? And this, is, this covers you know, almost every aspect of society. I mean, look at grocery stores. Look at all the stores that we go into. You know, we have to pay because of loss, because of theft. You know, that comes out of our pockets. Think how much cheaper <laughs> the things that we buy that we actually need. You know, and a lot of people in society right now, they're not, they're not going out and buying a lot of the wants. You know, William mentioned the... You know what a lot of people, uh, a lot of, especially a lot of teenagers, what they what they think that they they have to have, but what it is is really wants. A lot of people, you know, they live they live check to check, so you know they're mindful of that, and they manage their money very carefully, and they just get the things that they need. But because of certain other things, because of theft, which is continuously taking place, in, in fact employee theft in uh, many of the stores outpaces consumer theft. The employees are taking more than the consumers. And so the person who's working hard, 
you know, and, and using their money. They're not stealing. You know, they get their paycheck. They take care of their responsibilities. And now they have to go buy food and things like that for their, themselves and their family. They have to pay more. You see, so our dollar would be able to stretch a lot further if society practiced self-control in regards to honesty, in regards to uh, respecting the rights of, of ownership. Let's see here. In, in, light of, in light of the sharp rise in attacks we've seen in recent years, more and more people are calling for online data to be better protected. Well, the only problem with that is the more protections that are put in place, the more people are going to work hard to break around those protections, right? It's kind of like, um, you know, people get shot with guns, so let's put in gun, gun, control, gun control laws into effect. Well, that's not going to stop the person who does not respect life from doing harm to another person. You know, having more things to protect one's data is not going to stop the person from trying to breach and take your identity or break into your house or break into your car, <coughs> steal your radio and things like that. Manufacturers have kind of tried to make it a little bit harder to, you know, with these things. You know, the radios and things are kind of keyed or coded to the particular vehicle, but there's ways around that as well. So let's look at the bottom here of page 158. If not for the fear of being stolen from, no one would need keys or locks, uh, and the actions of a few can affect the lives of many. No one would need keys or locks. All right. So let's look over to page 159 here because, see, we get into this account here of one victim's experience with theft. And some of us might, might actually be able to, um, you know, empathize with this and going through some of these things ourselves. So we're going to read this, and then we're going to look at the questions that follow. Uh, this is the accounting of the person here, the victim. It says, I missed the train. I heard it pulling away from the platform just as I put my token in the turnstile. With a sigh of disappointment, I walked down the stairs and stood waiting for the next train that would take me to Manhattan. A young man in his teens bounded down the steps a few minutes after me. He didn't seem to notice me, and I quickly dismissed him from my thoughts as I wondered when the next train would arrive. Suddenly, I was brutally grabbed and shoved. This young man, who looked young enough to be my grandson, was trying to pull my bag from me because I had slung it over my shoulder. <coughs> he was pulling me along with my bag toward the staircase. Instinctively, I grabbed my bag and struggled to not trip and fall. He couldn't get the bag from over my shoulder and he began to curse and hit me in my face. Screaming for help, I realized that we were the only ones on the platform. I was dragged to the foot of the stairs, fearing that someone would hear me and come to my aid. He finally let go and sprinted up the stairs. My face was battered, my nose bleeding, and I realized that in the struggle, the strap on my bag had given way. He had gotten away with my bag. In it, I had the rent money and, gro and money for groceries. Now I have nothing. It took me a long time after that incident to find the courage to go anywhere alone. And now when I travel, I always make sure that there are other people on the platform so that I won't be alone. I'm afraid to be alone. Now, you think about this person here, you know, who, who went through this, and this was probably a daily routine for this, uh, this individual, wasn't thinking anything about that, you know, what was going to take place or potentially could take place, right? Uh, she had in her bag the money she needed to pay her rent and the money for food, right? Now, in most cases, sometimes... Uh, you know, the landowners, uh, they can be a little bit lenient and giving you a little extra time to pay your rent, but they're not going to let you just live at their place for free. Now, this person was being responsible and taking care of their responsibilities, and someone came and ripped that right out from underneath them, right? Now, she's going <clears> to <throat> have to work to accumulate more money, but now she's that much farther behind. Because what she relied on to take care of her daily needs 
there's been a big gap in that, okay? And unless she's able to find help or, or you know, get some type of uh, extension or something like that, she's going to be suffering. You know, she says she had nothing, not to mention the, the fear that she has of just being alone, where this wasn't the case before. She obviously walked back and forth to the, the you know, to take the subway every day or during the work week, and it was never an issue. But now she's afraid to be alone. So look here at the bottom here. There's two questions. It says, along with the victim's bag and money, what else was stolen from her? And notice here, some of the answers can include she also had her confidence, security, freedom to move about safely, and peace of mind stolen from her. That didn't just go with the bag. You know, that was not something tangible that could be held in the hand. You know, that that is a part of what's inside of a person. You know, that, that security, that's, that's something that you feel. You feel secure, right? Um, safety, you know, that's something that you feel. You know, you feel safe. You know, if you're in a big iron box and there was a, uh, or you've seen these guys, um, uh, they, they go into these shark cages. Uh, <laughs> that's risk-taking behavior there. <laughs> they go into these, these shark cages and it's a tourist thing and they'll they'll drop the cages and they'll drop some chum or whatever around them and uh, and they you know wait for the sharks to come around and, and kind of feed and bump up the, against the cages and so forth you know well for the most part I would think to some degree that um, that a person in that cage would feel secure they would feel safe that the bars on that cage is small enough to not allow a great white shark to get through uh, personally, I feel secure about not getting bitten by a shark five miles offshore. You know, I don't mean offshore in the in the water, five miles way away from the from the shore. You know, uh, despite popular belief from the 70s, there are no such things as land sharks. Okay, uh, lone sharks there are, <laughs> but not land sharks. So. So we see here, you know, this lady, she had physical things taken away, tangible things taken away from her, uh, things that she actually needed uh, to take care of her responsibilities and take care of her rent and her food, but also intangible things taken away from her. The feeling of security, freedom, safety. And this is something that we want to impress in the child's mind because if they are involved in something like this on the other side of it, in other words, not the victim, but the aggressor or the thief, this is a part of what they're contributing to, right? They're contributing to uh, a feeling of insecurity, not only in one person, but also in society. Think about this person if they're, uh, you know, they're, you know, uh, have, have grandchildren or, you know, a daughter or son who is concerned about them. Now they're going to be even more concerned about them because they were attacked. Not only were they stolen from, they were beaten. You know, this lady was beaten in the face, right? You know, they're going to, so they're going to be worried about her. They're going to be trying to do things and possibly going out of their way to see to it that she's a little bit more protected, whether that's, you know, taking off to drive her back and forth to work, you know, so it becomes a, a ripple effect that starts to affect many other people than just the victim. Then number two here, it says, <clears throat> what long-term effects did this crime have on the victim? Uh, so an example would be it made her distrust people. Uh, fearful of being alone and fearful of her own community. Uh, it affected the very quality of her life. And, and I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you, where you are kind of living in fear, right? Or where you're insecure. I mean, it, it's kind of like a, you know, like it just basically says here, you know, there's no trust. You know, there's no trust for anybody around you because everybody is a potential aggressor, right? And a lot of people who go through these things, now they classify it as kind of having a PTSD, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, because it is a stress. It is traumatic to have to go through something like that when you're kind of going on, minding your business, and then suddenly you're, you know, you're aggressively attacked and something that you need, you know, not only are you physically attacked, but something that you need that you didn't worry about before, now you're worried about, how are you going to pay the rent? You know, how are you going to put food on the table and so forth? So these are some of the things that come with, with theft and the consequences. This is just one example of one particular person. Every 15 seconds, someone's breaking in the house. 
every 14 seconds someone's stealing someone's identity, right? How often is someone's car being stolen? How often is someone being, uh, you know, robbed by violence? Uh, you know, how often are these things taking place on a daily basis? Well, right now, as we read there in 2020, it's increasing. So whatever it was before, it's going, it's getting um, higher and higher. Despite all the security measures and the um, defenses that we have in place, the real defense that we would have to stop this and turn this around is education. And that's what our job is. That's what we're training for right now. Now, you know, it's going to take a while. It's not going to be an overnight process. But I do guarantee that once these things are taught, right, and the person gets to the point to see what the end result of their ways will bring, you know, they're going to start changing. You know what? You know when a lot of people it starts changing? Either when it occurs directly to them or when it occurs to a loved one. And they see, they get to experience firsthand the pain and the suffering that they cause to someone else, okay? We'd like to stop it before it occurs to anybody else, right? Uh, and get people on the path of um, a kind of recuperation, right? Getting them, their minds trained to be benefic beneficial and peaceful members of society, to give and to not take away. So we're going to uh, pick up next class on page 160 when we get into straight talk here and uh, we're going to continue on thinking talking about self-control and what it is and and we're, we'll get into a little bit of how society is actually dealing with the millions of crimes that are taking place um you know in the united states but we know it's taking place throughout the world the united states we'll get into that a little bit later they're the largest incarcerator of um people out of any nation in the world. So our next class is going to be um, 8.14, and that's going to be 5.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your attention, and we look forward to seeing you at next class. Have a great evening.